This episode of the Wikipedia podcast is brought to you by Enemies Within the Church itself. Go to enemieswithinthechurch.com and use code change the direction. That's all one word, change the direction to get what is that? 25% off? Yes, that's right. 25% off from now until June 17th. Go on to enemieswithinthechurch.com, use code change the direction and get 25% off today. Let's get right into it. Welcome to the Wikipedia podcast. I am your host, Kyle Witt. This week, we do not have Micah Sample with us. He is out celebrating his wedding anniversary. So let's give him a little congratulations. That is such a blessing. But I do have something to make that up. We have two guests today. We have Dr. Russell Fuller and Dr. Tom Rush. These two men both blew the whistle at corruption at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, they've been a personal impact on me. I would not have made my video calling out the North American Missions Board, nor would I have been part of Enemies Within the Church at all if it wasn't for their step of faith. So we want to talk to these two men. Uh, now, their they're blowing the whistle was a little while ago, and we're going to talk to them about what, what exactly they did. But we want to talk about where things are at today, because the Southern Baptist Convention has gotten more dramatic since then. So, uh, Dr. Fuller, could you give us a little brief uh, introduction of yourself and a little rundown of what exactly happened and uh, wh what did you do to blow the whistle? Yes, I um, taught at Southern Seminary as an Old Testament professor for 22 years. Started in 1998 and I was uh, let go, fired in the year 2020. Uh, when I first came there, there was uh, a real shift going on where there was more conservative faculty members being hired. The older faculty was starting to leave. And uh, <clears throat> so there was quite a change going on. <clears throat> but in, even in my interview process, though, I told Danny Aiken, who was the dean at the time, I said, I do want you to know something, Danny. And if this is a problem, you, you know, I have a job right now. And so, you know, I don't have to come here. And I said, you've hired two new conservative Old Testament faculty members. And I said, but I want you to know I'm far more conservative than these guys. And if that's going to be a problem, let me know. And he goes, oh, that's not a problem at all. That's, that's just fine. And so they hired me. And, uh, of course, I believe that Al Mohler was a true conservative. And he was making some real changes and so forth. And so I believed. I believed in Al Mohler all the way. I was a, a big Al Mohler fan as anyone out there. But it didn't take long. Uh, even within the year, first year, I started to have some doubts because some of these new professors were teaching things like, uh, well, if the apostles took my class in interpretation, they'd be lucky to make a C. I would hear things like this. Uh, another professor made a statement to the effect that uh, um, that the author of Chronicles either just made a mistake or corrupted his sources. So there was words like this being said, statements like this being said. And when the administration would hear about it, they'd say, well, you know, Al had to hire him and, you know, we'll, 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 we'll keep everybody in line and so forth. But that really wasn't the case at all. And uh, even one professor, and I don't think you can see this on the, the seminary website anymore. I think they finally got rid of it. But one of the professors, it was Dan Block, he was an Old Testament professor, got up in chapel and preached against the doctrine of justification by grace through faith. He said that justification was an infusion of righteousness and not uh, what we believe as Protestants, where we are declared righteous in the sight of God. And so, again, this was a major departure from biblical orthodoxy. And uh, he got called into the office and told not to do that anymore, but it was no public statement correcting the record 
or anything like this. And so even early on, I had hints that uh, there's problems. But by the time you get to around 2007, 2008, uh, Al Mohler's writing articles now where he's saying he believes in uh, sexual orientation. And then finally, at a conference of the ERLC, he repents. He's, he's doing this right in front of a uh, gay activist. He tells them how uh, he repents that he uh, does not did not accept sexual orientation, which the earlier Al Mohler would have said that's the linchpin to the uh, agenda of the homosexual community. Well, now Al Mohler is accepting the, the very linchpin of that philosophy. And when that happened, I knew then we've got real trouble. We've got real trouble. Uh, <clears throat> and things just got worse from there. And finally, what brought it to a head was the promotion of a man named Matt Hall. Matt Hall was gonna be promoted to the second in command as provost of the institution. At that point, I realized if we're not going to fight for this, there's nothing else left to fight for. So we can't just let this pass. And so uh, I and two others, Mark Coppinger and Jim Oreck, these two gentlemen uh, deserve a lot of credit. And uh, they helped me out quite a bit in this. And we stood up and spoke against the promotion of Matt Hall. Uh, this caused a lot of trouble. And I knew this was signing my... Um, basically my death warrant there. I knew I was uh, going to be released after I did that. And uh, Mueller was furious at me, again, screamed at me in the meeting, uh, to calling me an idiot, and you don't know what you're talking about. But he couldn't refute anything I said. All I did is basically give Matt Hall quotes showing that he believed in critical race theory and that he was pushing critical race theory. And again, he couldn't come against this in any way. Well, when the, uh, and there's other problems at Southern. We had professors teaching that uh, the Bible teaches mythology. When Moeller was uh, interviewing this gentleman, he had my notes that I had prepared showing from his dissertation and from a paper he gave at a scholarly society that he was holding to the fact that the author of the book of Job, and by the way, also Isaiah, uh, teaches mythology, which by definition, of course, is error. And the apostles talk about mythology and they always contrast it with the truth. And so uh, Moeller knew all of this. And the man who prepped Moeller for this interview, uh, he was his top research assistant and he had my notes. He got it from me. And after the interview, he asked Moeller, he goes, well, did you hire him? And Moeller's response was, well, yeah. And he goes, well, how could you hire him? And Moeller's response was, uh, this is what he told me, that the, uh, his, his research assistant. Well, his doctrine of inspiration is all messed up, but he says he can sign our statement of faith, and that's all that matters. And so that's Al Mohler uh, right there. That's Al Mohler. Um, of course, I was seeing other things. Al Mohler was writing articles that was very pro uh, uh, Black Lives Matter. We had speakers on campus pushing Black Lives Matter in the classroom. And... Uh, so we had that going on at Southern Seminary. We had other professors pushing postmodernism, but critical race theory, social justice really took root there. And there's still plenty of professors at Southern Seminary today who are doing it. But Mueller got his chance to fire me in 2020 when we had the COVID lockdown. And so he used that as an excuse to get rid of me and Jim Oreck. He had got, already got rid of, um, of Mark Coppinger a little earlier than that but he used that as the opportunity to uh, fire me. And so uh, that's, um, that's basically my story in a nutshell. And so uh, I've seen the conservative Al Mohler, the liberal Al Mohler, and then the, the Mohler who goes back and forth. I've, I've seen it all. Okay, so Dr. Rush, tell us a little bit about uh, you know, yourself and what was your story? What's your relationship to uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary? Well, Kyle, thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here and, and to talk about this. Um, I, I've been a Southern Baptist all my life. In, in fact, I often you know, say I was a Southern Baptist six months before I was born. Uh, back in the day, Southern Baptists had a cradle roll program, and when someone found out that they were pregnant, uh, they enrolled them in Sunday school. So I was enrolled in Sunday school six months before I was born. And uh, I love the Southern Baptist Convention, and I'm heartbroken at the, the direction that our convention has been going. 
Uh, I was heavily involved in the conservative resurgence when we turned our uh, denomination uh, around before. Uh, I've, I'll celebrate my 40th uh, year in the ministry this year. I've been a pastor and a military wow. chaplain uh, all that time. I spent uh, 28 years in the military, 21 as a chaplain, retired in 2005 from the Air Force. Um, and so I've had a wide variety of experiences that God has blessed me with. And uh, over the years, I've been privileged to serve at uh, uh, the state and uh, national level in Southern Baptist life. Uh, and it's been a great honor to do that. In 2014, I went to Southern Seminary as a trustee. Uh, I had a great deal of uh, respect and still do uh, for Dr. Moeller and many of the things that he accomplished. Uh, I was well aware of the, the liberal drift of our seminaries. I was a student at Southeastern back in the early and mid 80s. So uh, certainly had experience with that kind of thing before. And so uh, really felt like that uh, that Southern had turned the corner and was, uh, you know, a great institution and and conservative theology and all that. Uh, but uh, after serving on the board for the first uh, four, five years, I, I began to become concerned about things that were happening there. And, and I've talked yeah. about a number of those things before, but, uh, you know, two of them were uh, the uh, leaning of the seminary and the leaning of Dr. Moeller towards uh, a, a woke position uh, and, and actually the teaching of critical race theory and intersectionality. Uh, now, of course, uh, as you are well aware, uh, Dr. Moeller denies that the seminary uh, teaches uh, CRT and intersectionality, um, uh, but I have I've questioned that in trustee meetings and I've questioned Dr. Moeller about it personally, and uh, the the facts are there, and I will share some of those a, a little bit later. Uh, but uh, mm-hmm. and I've been on the board now for for eight years, and, and over the last the three or four years, I've been you know bringing questions to the board and. Uh, uh, requesting that uh, that uh, actions be taken to uh, reverse uh, this teaching. Uh, I think the most interesting thing that uh, Dr. Moeller has uh, said to me uh, was uh, when I questioned him about uh, teaching uh, CRT, and uh, the evidence that I had at the time was primarily class notes from Dr. Jarvis Williams' class, which uh, you all have at Enemies Within the Church on your website. Anybody can go to them and pull them up and read them. And of course, it's chock full of uh, critical race theory, liberation theology, uh, intersectionality, all of that terminology is there. And uh, Dr. Moeller's statement was, is that, well, uh, we're not teaching CRT, we're teaching about it. And and uh, that, that really is almost a laughable thing, Kyle, because uh, you know, when I was a student back in uh, the uh, 80s at Southeastern, uh, the question was the teaching of the documentary hypothesis for understanding the Old Testament. And the president at that time of Southeastern Seminary said at the Southern Baptist Convention, we're not teaching the documentary hypothesis, we're teaching about it. Of course, I was a student in the classroom and I was having JEPD crammed down my throat. And so I knew exactly what they were doing. And, and, here's, and here's the thing. What, what we've discovered is uh, with... Uh, Uh, Matt Hall, Curtis Woods, Jarvis Williams, and others, um, they are using the concepts, the vocabulary, and the terminology of critical race theory. And to, you know, and and here's what bothers me, and this is the reason that it, it, that it's become such a concern for, for me personally as a Southern Baptist. One is, is that, uh, you, you remember uh, Rush Limbaugh talking about low information voters. And uh, he was always trying to educate people about what was going on. He felt like if people knew what was happening, they would be better informed when they went to the ballot box. You know, thank God for Rush Limbaugh and all that uh, he did for the conservative movement in America. Well, in the Southern Baptist Convention, we have low information pastors. And and I don't mean to say that in a pejorative way. I understand the ministry. I've been doing it for 40 years. When you're doing the ministry, you're busy. You're you're doing everything that you possibly can to take care of your congregation, to prepare sermons, uh, to take care of your flock. Uh, I get it. It's it's a busy life. But we have got to care enough about our convention to get informed. And and so uh, this is part of, of the reason for my doing this. So I would certainly oppose the teaching of CRT in our seminaries or anyway, you know, through Lifeway or any other entity 
of the Southern Baptist Convention. I would be opposed to our mission boards uh, teaching uh, their church planters and the missionaries CRT philosophy to use in their process of work. And, and you are well aware of that happening, so I'm not uh, giving you any information you don't already have. But, but this is where I've become concerned. While I would be opposed to teaching it, it bothers me even more that we deny that we're teaching it. If you're going yeah. to teach it, just be honest about it and say we're teaching CRT because we think we ought to be woke. That way, everybody would know. Now, it, what, what we what we have is is a, a sort of a contention that comes up. You see, uh, in that there mm -hmm. are those of us like Dr. Fuller and Dr. Oric and myself who are exposing what's going on, like yourself exposing what was going on at uh, at now, and it's like, well, now who who do we believe? I just I think integrity is important, and and I and I wish they would just be honest about it. I would have much more respect for Dr. Mueller if he would simply be honest about the fact that yes, we are teaching CRT and intersectionality at Southern Seminary. Now I have a, a number of things, and we can talk about this as we progress on here, uh, that I think uh, provide uh, absolute proof that that's what's going on, and our Southern Baptist pastors need to do the research, need to do the work, need to inform their congregations. And I would hope that they would come uh, to Anaheim next week and change the direction. Uh, if they're unable to come to Anaheim, they still need to be working and doing whatever they can to help us change the direction of our denomination. Oh, yeah. You know, you oh, know yeah. Tom, um, when I was in the principal's office at Southern getting in trouble again, uh, Herschel York, who is currently the uh, dean of the School of Theology, told me that critical race theory and social justice has never been taught on this campus. And I couldn't believe he said it with a straight face. And at another time, when I was in uh, Moeller's office uh, again, the, la the last time, I said this to Moeller. I said, you know, Herschel York has even made the statement that critical race theory, social justice has never been taught at this campus. And Moeller's response was priceless. He goes, well, he believes that. It was interesting. He didn't say, well, I believe that. It's not being done. He knew not to. He couldn't look me in the eye and say, well, it has never been taught on this campus. He had to say, well, he believes that. Right. <laughs> you know? And uh, right. he Moeller has his truth. Being taught there. And, and I so think, does Herschel uh, York. It was, so uh, I saw a video of, of Walter Strickland, who, of course, is a professor at Southeastern and, and a huge proponent of CRT. That's, you know, that's <laughs> what he teaches at Southeastern. And uh, yeah. Matt Hall had uh, had denied that he was teaching CRT, so kind of the, the same sort of thing that Herschel York said. No, we're not teaching CRT. I don't teach CRT. I don't believe in CRT. And it was about the time that he said that, that Walter Strickland called Matt Hall an expert in CRT. <laughs> and so, you know, either you're an expert in it uh, and you believe in it and you teach it or, or you're not. But uh, the, 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 the documentation is out there. Nobody has to believe me or Dr. Fuller in our testimony. Uh, several years ago, Dr. Moeller commissioned the writing of, uh, of this book, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen it before, but removing the stain of racism from the Southern yep. Baptist Convention. If a pastor, a denominational worker or leader out there wants to know whether or not Southern Seminary uh, believes in and teaches critical race theory, all you have to do is, all you have to have is a rudimentary knowledge of CRT. And if you read this book, you'll see the terminology is uh, throughout the book. And, uh, you know, I, I could I could go through and, and, and give a sampling, but one of the things that, of course, uh, there were a number of contributors to the book. It was uh, edited by Jarvis Williams and uh, Kevin Jones. Uh, but uh, Moeller has a chapter uh, in the book. He's a contributor. And he says this about the gospel, Kyle. He says, the gospel offers a hope that celebrates the breaking down of ethnic barriers and celebrates the sound of the gospel in different languages and tongues. Well, actually, what the gospel does is it tells the sinner they're a sinner, and it gives them the solution through the substitutionary uh, vicarious atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they repent of their sin, place their faith and trust in Christ and surrender his lordship, they are saved. And they're saved from sin, including racism and 
all the other things. Now, uh, does that mean that people to get saved uh, immediately overcome their sin? Well, no, we don't. And that's why we need yeah, to continue exactly. to preach the word and encourage people to live right. But, uh, you know, this is the social gospel. Uh, it's not yeah. explicit, but clearly it's the social gospel. What what we need is the scriptural gospel, and we need to preach that people would get saved regardless of their skin color or ethnicity. And uh, and, and so that uh, that should be a concern to anybody. And, of course, uh, one of the things that uh, that Dr. Moeller has has done um, since my uh, last uh, report on the seminary is uh, to set aside five million dollars uh, for, uh, I guess you would say, scholarship support uh, for uh, African-American students that come to Southern. And uh I, I just think I think it's unbiblical. I think it's wrong. Now he uh, he did uh, brag after uh, the vote on that was taken in the trustee board that it was unanimous. And I have to, have to admit that I made a, a calculated error. I just abstained from the vote because I had no support in the trustee vote board. So I abstained, and uh, I should have I should have been more more vocal. So uh, let me apologize for that uh, even now. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, what, what we need to do is we need to support students who, for whatever reason, regardless of their skin color, that can't afford to go to seminary, but have a genuine call from God on their life. Oh, yeah. And I, I, I'm i glad you mentioned it that way, because to, to me, it seems like that Mueller is running a grad school. And it, it's run exactly like a secular uh, a grad school. You know, right. you go get your bachelor's degree and this is where you come and get your master's degree and it's prestigious and there's lots of money involved rather than looking at and assessing, is this man called by God to preach the word of God? Yes. Okay. Then we will find a way to equip him. Right. Right. Uh, frustrates me. Frustrates me beyond belief. Well, and it, and um, it should. And, and one of the things, Kyle, that, uh, that, that bothers me is the recruiting efforts that are made and the type of organizations that uh, the seminary spends a lot of money like uh, uh, T4G and T, uh, TGC. Uh, these are the types of organizations where we go to recruit students. And uh, when we come as trustees, uh, what, we, what we always hear is this is the greatest seminary in the history of Christendom. We're the biggest. We're training the most professors. I mean, the most students, the most preachers. Um, we have the most money. We're the we're the we're the most sound um, seminary from a financial standpoint of all the seminaries that have ever existed in the history of time. And uh, I suppose there's there's there are some things that would be good about that. Uh, but 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 I would rather. I would rather than we have the know that we have the most students and the most money is to know that we are the most faithful to the word of God and training up men of God. And if we if it if it means to be faithful to the word of God and to train faithful pastors for the pulpit in our Southern Baptist churches, if that means we are going to end up having less students and being smaller then praise God, because God's going to honor us mm -hmm. for honoring his word and teaching mm -hmm. in accordance with uh, our our uh, our confessional documents, the abstract and the Baptist faith and message. Yeah, we're, we're selling pastorates. We're not discipling and raising up men to be pastors, which is we could get on a rabbit trail about that. But let, let's let's yes, continue moving on. So. So one thing I want to bring up is. Have things started to change, whether positive or negative at Southern, since the two of you called things out? And and on that note, Matt Hall is gone. So doesn't that mean that things are moving in a positive direction? Uh, Dr. Fuller, what are your thoughts on, the, on, on those two things? Yes, when uh, I did my interviews with John Harris, and then, of course, an interview with uh, Enemies Within the Church, I mentioned four people in particular. Two of them are now gone. Um, uh, Dominic Hernandez, he was the Old Testament professor who uh, teaches, again, the Bible teaches mythology, and Matt Hall. They're both gone now. And so 
and personally, I think unless uh, we blew the whistle on this, I think they would still be there. Now, I, I can't prove yeah. that, obviously. But yeah. I think that the, the light that was shined upon the problems at Southern Seminary uh, helped these gentlemen to uh, move on. For Hernandez, I remember in the classroom, students would come up to me after they'd be in his classroom and they'd say, you know, he keeps talking about how conservative he is. And he goes, one guy goes, it's like a child who's constantly telling you they didn't do something and you just know <laughs> they did do it. And, and uh, uh, one of the last, like the last paper I read at Southern Seminary it was by a man wanting to get into the PhD program and he did. And again, it had all kinds of liberalism in this paper. And I knew the gentleman, I knew he wasn't that liberal. I said, why did you say uh, these kinds of things? He goes, oh, Hernandez told me to put that in there, you know. And so uh, wow. his liberalism uh. was very well. Matt Hall, again, got a lot of uh, pushback. And Matt Hall's even had trouble at one of the churches that he was a leader in in, in Louisville because some of the members were starting to ask very difficult questions of him. And he didn't do well. And he he just constantly doubled down. And he would say he doesn't believe in critical race theory, but he wouldn't back off of anything else that he really has said, which is pure critical race theory. And so a lot yeah. of people saw him as disingenuous, dishonest. And so not only did he leave his church where he was an elder, but uh, eventually he would leave the seminary. And I remember Moeller one time in a um, in a chapel message or before chapel, it was, it was during chapel, excuse me, in which he says, look, I know a lot of people have left Southern Seminary to go to other places, but Matt Hall will never leave this place. And he was letting it be known, Matt Hall was going to be the next president of uh, Southern Seminary. He yep. would not be let go. And uh, of course, now he's gone. And so uh, there have been changes. Moeller has gotten, uh, he, you know, he disassociated from Together for the Gospel, which he, that was his baby. I mean, mm -hmm. that was yes, something it was. That he was very proud of. He, got, he also resigned from the Gospel Coalition. And so he's, he's clearly feeling the pressure, and he wants to be viewed as still the conservative school in the Southern Baptist Convention. But notice he's trying to move back to the right again. So Al Mohler, uh, as the old faculty that trained him used to say, uh, he's like the weather vane. Watch for the winds and watch which way he's blowing. And that'll tell you where he is theologically. Yeah. Right now, he wants to appear because he's gotten a lot of uh, criticism uh, through things like enemies within the church, the John Harris videos and other things. Right. And so Moeller wants to make the school look conservative again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, Kyle, the, I think the thought there's... that pops into my head Go is ahead. uh, yeah. you, you mentioned that uh he repented, and that, yes. that word is imp very important. He's willing to repent of his orthodox biblical view of homosexuality. Correct. Yet, he doesn't repent of, you know, getting rid of Matt Hall, getting rid of all these other things, right. uh, leaving T4G, leaving TCG. He doesn't repent. That's all done secretly and silently. Oh, yes. Yeah. And a lot of things are taken off the websites. There's a lot of cover up. They mm -hmm. do not come clean about what they've done. They do not come clean. And you see this again at South uh, Southeastern. But you see the same thing they had on their website. Yeah. They had uh, kingdom diversity or something like this. And they just totally took it all down. No explanation, no repentance. Mm -hmm. and so it's uh, it's it's a game being played, to be quite honest with you. Well, yeah, that, that's, this, that's, yeah right. that's the thing that people need to understand. You, I, I know from students who still contact me and others that liberalism is still being taught at Southern Seminary and social justice, critical race theory. This stuff is still being taught. All you have to do is look at Jarvis Williams's latest book. It is clearly pushing a critical race theory. And uh, I mean, you know, he's still teaching there. And yeah. so don't be deceived. I, I, Mueller will do things like this. He had James Lindsay come on his podcast. And it, the whole point was yeah. Lindsay was going to go after critical race theory. And Mueller sitting there bobbing his head. That's right. That's right. Well, Lindsay knew he was being used. And so a few <laughs> weeks later, Lindsay on his Facebook page says, do you want to know what critical race theory looks like? And he has a clip of Matt Hall. He knew Mueller was using it. 
And so he comes out with this clip of Matt Hall. Hmm. And by the way, if you go to my Facebook page, I reposted. You have to look down a ways. But it's there. And again, James Lindsay knew he was being used by Moeller to give him conservative credibility that he's truly against critical race theory. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Lindsay, you want to know what critical race theory looks like? Look at this. <laughs> so, the, so he knew it. You, you know what it reminds me of? It, it, and people need to understand. So if, if Moeller is willing to repent of an orthodox view of homosexuality, right. but he's not willing to repent of these other things, that's a problem. That shows he's putting on... When they're exposed and then he backs off of them, that Correct. shows that he's putting on a face. He's putting on a shell. What it reminds me of is uh, Mormons. If you meet a Mormon, they come to your door. They are what? They're the nicest people you will ever meet. They look so good, so nice. Go to Salt Lake City and let it be known that you're a Christian. Specifically, let it be known that you're a Baptist and see how fast that veneer drops. You will see them behind the scenes, behind you're, the. You're exactly the, right. I've been to front. Salt Lake City and and done exactly that, and, and you're exactly right about that, Kyle. Oh yeah, they're they're let vicious. Me, let me say this: in faculty meetings, uh, when when you would see Moeller really get upset, is when he felt like uh, he was getting criticism from conservatives. That just infuriates Al Moeller, mm. and he always you could tell. When, when liberals would criticize him, he it didn't bother him much. But when the conservatives did, oh man, you could the, the real hatred would come out, and he really went after mm. people like John MacArthur and others, uh, even calling the people behind the Dallas statement or the statement on social justice, calling them a bunch of racists. But yet he has no evidence that these people are racist whatsoever. Right. But yet he says, if you sign that statement then you're agreeing with all the racist things these guys say on their blogs. But he doesn't give any examples of this. Of, of course, again, this always. Is, well, of course. And again, this is this is just slander, and it's very yeah. sad. And then he, he makes statements like the, you know, again, the social justice statement does not see any victims. Uh, it's like the man ha didn't read it. It certainly does say that. So again, it's always, he, as they say, he punches to the right. He never punches yep. to the left. Yep. Yep. Well, uh, I, I don't want to get distracted on that because that's such a thing that <laughs> frustrates me. But uh, Dr. Rush, you know, do you have any thoughts on on just kind of the direction of of South Southern Baptist Theological Seminary? And so you're still a trustee there, right? So you're still right. in in the mud, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm still so, there. I've, I've got uh, two years left on my uh, on my term. Do you think they're going to bring you back? Well, I mean, I'm not eligible to come back by the rules of the convention. So you you get okay, uh, okay. You you can you can serve two five year terms. So I, I'm in my second term, mm. and um, uh, you know, I, I think, Tom, haven't they made a few? Uh, Tom, haven't they made a few exceptions on this? Uh, in other words, there were certain people who get to serve an extra term, not necessarily at the seminaries, but on other. Um, trustee boards in the Southern Baptist Convention. Yes, I so, believe people have had. Yeah, that's that's Go correct, uh, Dr. Fuller. Um, the way that mm. works would be when you come in and fill uh, an unexpired term. So say that uh, that someone's elected as a trustee and they serve for a couple of years and they move to another state, um, then they have to resign from the board. And so someone is elected to fill that term then they've been allowed to serve two terms. So somebody could serve up to 13 or 14 years, uh, but that would be in that specific situation. I'm not in that situation. And so by the rules of the convention, I, I won't have uh, any any further time uh, to serve on the board. Uh, but uh, it takes uh, it takes more than one person to do it. Uh, you know, you, you, you've got to you've got to have some help. And, and I have. Uh, I have taught, I've, got, I've had trustees say to me, you know, that essentially they agree with me, uh, but they're not willing to stand up and be counted. And, and to me, that's very sad. Uh, they, they really, they know what's going on. And, uh, you know, as to, is it worse? Yeah, it's continuing to drift to the left. Now, I think that there's been some uh, public relations things that Dr. Moeller has done. Uh, to try to make it look like it's not as bad as it is. But 
you know, you had the book come out uh, that I mentioned earlier, Removing the Stain of Racism from the Southern Baptist Convention. And then uh, Dr. Fuller mentioned uh, Jarvis Williams' new book. And uh, I mean, all you've got to do is just read a few pages. You can just read the introduction and it is full of critical race theory terminology. Now, you're going to tell me that a professor who writes a book that clearly, and I mean, even uses the word critical race theory. Uh, and so, or the terminology, it, it uses that, that exact term. So you're going to tell me that a professor writes a book, but he's not going to teach from that book. Uh, that just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and, and so uh, the, the evidence is overwhelming. This is uh, the direction that we're going. Uh, it's more of a covert nature. I will agree to that. Uh, it's something that we're trying to cover up. But what's covert will become overt before it's over. And that's oh, my yeah. concern. We've got to change the direction. And the only way we can do that is to elect a godly conservative man who will appoint, appoint uh, a committee on committees, who will appoint a committee on nominations, who will appoint trustees that have the courage of their convictions. Uh, I think there's a lot of a lot of pastors that uh, they, they would say that they have courageous convictions, but when they don't exercise the courage of those convictions, what they really have is preferences, not convictions. There you go. And they would they would prefer that Dr. Moeller not take the position that he's taken, for example, on uh, same-sex attraction. They would prefer that uh, he not have someone like Matt Hall on the faculty. And, and by the way, uh, Matt Hall's leaving had nothing to do, uh, I don't believe, with any pressure from the administration or Dr. Moeller to leave. He just simply got another opportunity. I, you know, I can't speak for Matt, and, and I want to say I think Matt's a, a nice guy. I consider Matt a friend. I just disagree with him theologically, pragmatically, and, and in many other ways about how we uh, approach ministry. Um, you know, I contacted him and wished him well in his new position out at Biola. Uh, but I think that, uh, that Matt may have been concerned that uh, the Southern Baptist Convention is going to turn back to a more uh, conservative, uh, turn back to its uh, conservative foundational roots, and that's not going to leave a place for him. So let's get out while we can. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm not speaking for him, and I certainly have no factual knowledge, but that's what it looks like to me. Um, but, uh, you know, I am, I am hopeful for our convention in Anaheim uh, that we can change the direction. I'm hopeful that uh, Tom Askall will be uh, our new president after we leave California. Uh, and, uh, but, but pastors, Southern Baptist pastors have got to get concerned about this leftward drift and start doing something about it. Well, it, it reminds me of, uh, uh, the, you know, the man that says I die for, you know, I die for Christ. I die for Christ. Uh, and the response is, well, why aren't you living for him right now? Exactly. <laughs> and, and that's the, and you know, the whole, uh, COVID situation revealed that for a lot of Christians in general, but for a lot of pastors that they have a lot of stated conviction, uh, of what they would do in a circumstance. But as you said, it's preference. I would prefer not to shut my church down for a year, but I'm going to do it anyway. Right. right. Uh, and, oh no, why did my church essentially implode after I did that? Um, it's it's not it's nauseating, but a question I have for the two of you. I'll, I'll make it a two part question. So the first part: Who is the real Al Mohler? Because we hear a lot. You know, you know we've talked about he kind of has a puts up a face. He's trying to appeal uh, to the liberals, appeal to the conservatives. Uh, he's kind of playing both sides, and then behind closed doors, he acts a different way. So who's the real Al Mohler? And also, why is it important for Southern Baptists to know this going into the convention next week? Well, uh, my opinion, well, again, when I first went to Southern Seminary, I was thoroughly convinced that Al Mohler was a convictional conservative and that um, he was really about changing Southern Seminary and so forth. 
And there's no doubt he did change Southern Seminary, but he needed to do that in order to be the president of Southern Seminary and, re, and remain the president of Southern Seminary. But again, once if you do the math, um, go out about 10 to 15 years after he was elected. By that time, he was able to uh, basically have a whole new group of trustees uh, and basically, they can handpick these guys. Um, I know that because a friend of mine uh, got a phone call one time from one of the uh, seminary presidents right now. Do you want to be a trustee for me? Oh, how could he do that? He's not supposed to be able to do that, but that's what he did with my friend. So these guys can pretty much handpick their own people. If you do the math, Moeller came in 93, uh, go out about 10 or 15 years. That's when Moeller starts moving back in the other direction. You see, he starts going into, again, uh, sexual orientation and things like this. So and what the old school used to say about him, because he was completely liberal back in the day, <laughs> uh, even though Moeller will say, well, yeah, I was on women in ministry, but I always believed in the inspiration of Scripture. He's quoted as saying that in the press. But even his friend Mark Dever uh, had an interview with uh uh, down in uh, Birmingham at the Southern Baptist Convention, I believe that was 2019. And Mark Dever was being interviewed by um, uh, Tom Askell. And what, uh, uh, what uh, Dever said was, well, you know, when Al Mohler tells his biography, it gets more conservative every time he says it. And then they all start <laughs> laughing because it was a joke. Every mm -hmm. time he talks, he's, he acts like he's more conservative, you see. What the old school guys would always say is he had no core convictions. He was as liberal as anybody on this campus. He was Roy Honeycutt's right-hand man who was the former president. But when he mm -hmm. saw that, look, if you're going to become the next president of Southern Seminary, you're going to have to be conservative, he became a conservative. Roy Honeycutt made this a statement. He goes, look, had we uh, moderates, meaning the liberals, had won <laughs> the conservative resurgence, he goes, Al Mohler would still be the president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. That's what they believed about him. And for the longest right. time, I wouldn't I would not believe that. I was like, no, no, look what he's done. He's gotten rid of the, this old faculty and so forth. Well, yeah, they despised him. They looked at him and they knew what he really was. And so he wanted to get rid of them. And he paid a lot of money to get rid of these guys. Right. But over time, the way he's gone back and he'll say things again, like you know, the church is, is homophobic. You know, the church wouldn't accept uh, 20 years ago the, you know, what uh, Sam Albury is saying right now. Well, Al Mohler would have accepted it 20 years ago. I mean, because that's what he believed, you know. But again, I, I think he's an opportunist, just like the people who raised him, just like uh, his right. He was the right hand man of Roy Honeycutt. They believe he's a, an absolute opportunist. And that's yeah. exact. I think they're right. It took me years to come to that conclusion. But watching Al Mohler down through the years. Uh, he'll do anything. Like, for instance, uh, let me just tell you one more thing that's very important. Right now, uh, the sexual uh, abuse task force and all these mm. things going on. Mueller defends um, Jennifer Lyell as being a victim. And again, she had a relationship with a man for over 12 years, starting when she was 26 years old. Uh, according to the scriptures, if you look at like Deuteronomy chapter, I believe it's 23, it talks about if a man abuses a woman, she is to cry out. Yeah. And if you look in scripture, we have an example of this with Amnon and Tamar, mm -hmm. how she cried out. And then even after she cried out and she was, you know, let loose, as it were, by uh, Amnon, uh, what does she do? She throws dirt on her head. She's crying. And she is making it very clear what happened to her. She didn't just let this thing go for uh, 12 years, you see. And so, but Al Mohler's turning her, and of course, uh, uh, so is Rachel Denhollander and these other folks, into a victim, where I believe <laughs> that's not true at all. But Al Mohler, he's an opportunist. He will do what Al Mohler has to do. And I, I think this is, uh, this is terrible. And by the way, in, Nash, in, in Birmingham in 2019, Southern Baptist Convention, they changed the constitution of the Southern Baptist Convention. If you don't agree with the Me Too idea of sexual abuse as opposed to consenting adults, then your church can be thrown out of the Southern Baptist Convention. It right. can be, you know, put to uh, the committee 
uh, of credentials and so forth. So Al Mohler will do anything. He defends, yeah. uh, he's all with uh, Rachel Den Hollander all the way on this. And again, this was a um, relationship that lasted 12 years since she was 26 years old. And she wasn't a student the whole time. That's not true at all. And so again, for Mohler to defend things like this, I see is absolute wickedness. Well, yeah, I mean, he's he's pushing that, that Me Too agenda that's yes, seeping right. into the SBC and is trying to, you know, it, 2019, that's a huge mistake to give the SBC that, that sort of power. And now they're capitalizing on it. They're trying to they're put trying more to, right. hierarchy on things so that they can turn that, that what looked like a protection, like a shield, now unsheath it and reveal that it was actually a right. sword, and now they're going to start lopping heads. But uh, yeah, if, you, oh, wait, that's wait. Right. if you don't see sexual abuse, like Rachel Den Hollander, and then you're, you're in trouble in the Southern Baptist Convention today. And I, mm-hmm. I fear in Anaheim, they're going to basically, again, put into you know, the Southern Baptist Constitution uh, these recommendations, and I think many of them are very dangerous recommendations. Yeah, they, they are really the Southern Baptist now, Let me say one more thing. We in the Southern Baptist now, we judge these um, consensual uh, sexual encounters or whatever. We're judging these things by the standard of what the world says as opposed yeah. to what Scripture teaches. Right. Yeah. We've decided to go with the world on critical race theory. We've decided to go with the world on Me Too. And listen, we're going to go there with homosexuality as well. That's the direction we're going. We're, so the woke we're a couple of feet down there. That's right. The woke progressives are in charge at the Southern Baptist Convention, and that's every leader in the um, agencies of the Southern Baptist Convention, including all the presidents of the seminaries, all of them. Right, right. Yeah, well, yeah, that's the that's the scary point we're at in the SBC. Uh, and th- again, they weaponized more things than that over the course of time. Of course. And a lot of these churches that are going to get hit, that they're going to come after, are going to lose their buildings, too, because yeah. they signed them over to the SBC. Uh, yeah, let me but- just say- yeah, let me say one okay. more thing about that. Um, our leaders won't even speak out when we go into the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in New Orleans and lie to those judges and say that the Southern Baptist Convention is like the Roman Catholic Church. We're a hierarchy organization as opposed uh. to cooperating churches. Not one leader in the Southern Baptist Convention said a word about that. Not one. Now, Al Mohler, when he was asked, he goes, well, I can't talk about an ongoing uh, case. Well, it hasn't even gone to court yet. But can't you, as a leader of the Southern Baptist Convention, tell us what our church polity is? Are it's we funny uh, the times he we can speak and the times he can't. Or, or, or what are we? And by the way, when Al Mohler, again, would talk about the Me Too, uh, he put pressure on the executive committee to waive attorney-client privilege but yet, when he ha- when he does an investigation of Southern Seminary, he will not waive attorney client privilege right. on the same issue. So again, yeah. I-, I see Mueller as a complete um, opportunist. Yeah, yep. Uh, me, Dr. Rush, now, let me what, uh, say something. What are your to thoughts this? on that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, let me talk, talk about two two things quickly here. Uh, you know, first, uh, who is Al Mueller? Unfortunately, I don't think we really know. Uh, I would agree with Dr. Fuller. I I once certainly thought he was a convictional conservative. Um, As far as the trustee system, um, the bottom line is the entity heads have way too much influence over the selection process. I don't think I was picked to be a trustee, but I think I went through a vetting process. In, in other words, uh, you know, hey, we're thinking about electing Tom Rush from Georgia. You know, is, is that OK? And, and what Al would have known about me at the time is that he probably would have said, yeah, that's OK. We'll be glad to have Tom on the board. Um, I don't think he would say that today uh, if he had the choice. But, um, uh, you know, we, we need better governance of our entities. Our trustee system is broken. And, and of course, that was the yeah. problem uh, back when the conservative resurgence started. And it began in 79 and it took us through the mid 90s to get it turned around. This is not a problem that's going to be solved overnight. 
Uh, it, it could no. start in Anaheim. I trust that it will. But we're talking about a long process here. Now, I do know for a fact that uh, due to the fact that we did not have a convention in 2020, uh, that Al used the rules to handpick two trustees. So the two trustees that came on out of the 2020 were handpicked by Al and uh, and and put on the board. I, and, and the way the rules are, are written, the trustees can elect someone to fill the expired terms of those that, when there was no convention to elect them. And uh, I was the only trustee that voted no on Al's choices. Uh, now, they do have to be elected by the next convention that comes along. But uh, we all know, those of us that have been doing this and going to the convention for years and years, it is very unusual for someone that is nominated, that's on the nominating committee report, even to be opposed. And, and I'm not aware of but, but the very few instances where uh, someone was replaced on the convention floor. It is a tedious process. Yeah. It can only be done one at a time. Um, and so anyway, that's that, that's part of the problem. Now, uh, when we, we look at this, uh, uh, the sex abuse task force, of course, uh, if you in any way oppose any of the recommendations, then the allegation is you don't care about sex abuse victims. Nothing could be further from the truth. And one of the things that has bothered me about this, this whole process is, is that we have had churches and pastors by the thousands who have done this right over and over and over. Um, yeah. I, I've done it right. Uh, my son's a pastor. He's done it right. Um, we have uh, contacted the authorities when it was appropriate. We have exercised church discipline when it was appropriate. And we have cared for victims. Uh, but here's, a, here's, a, here's a, the, to me, the, the, the bottom line. Um, the Southern Baptist Convention is not top down. This is the danger is that we're putting the convention. These recommendations put the convention in a position of authority over the churches yep. in spite of terminology that they're using to try to soften that. Uh, we don't need a list. We don't need a list. I, I've got the, uh, the recommendations here uh, on, on my desk and uh, they're, they're wanting to, put together uh, a, uh, a list of ministers who have been credibly accused. And, of course, they're talking about bringing in third-party uh, qualified firms to do this. And I want, I want pastors to think about this. Guidepost put out their report, and we already have factual information that one pastor and another church were falsely accused. And we're yep. going to trust the task force to put together, we're going to trust the executive committee to put together. I'll tell you what's going to happen. People's lives and ministries are going to be ruined because they're going to be falsely accused. Allegations are just okay. that. I have uh, been I dealt with a situation where I had to look up some information, and I went to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation Sex Offender Registry, and there was the information I needed right there. The FBI has one on a national basis. The Southern Baptist Convention yep. does not have the resources, nor does it have the reasoning to create their own list. The list are there. If someone is convicted, if someone, uh, you know, has uh, uh, has gone to jail, they, they're, they're, they've been convicted of a criminal offense, then their name's going to be on a list. And, you know, to say that, that we're going to go with credibly accused and we're going to use a preponderance of evidence and we're going to take that from attorneys who are looking for a place where they can go make some money. I mean, I just Googled it before we got on today. And the law firms out there that are advertising, if you were sexually mm -hmm. abused in a Southern Baptist church, call us. We can get you money. I tell you who's going to end up with our missions yep. money. The attorneys are. They're the ones that are going yep. to end up with the money. And uh, th this is a really serious and dangerous situation. And, uh, you know, uh, again, certainly um, our hearts break for anybody that's been sexually abused. Uh, but a consensual yeah. relationship between two adults is not abuse, no matter who calls it that. And it takes a lot of wisdom to discern this. But the unfortunate thing uh, with these types of, uh, of, of allegations when they come out is that oftentimes it's a he said, she said thing. It is really difficult yeah. sometimes to get at the truth. That's why 
In America, we have a biblical jurisprudence system that allows someone to be innocent until proven guilty. Hey, it's not a perfect system because it's run by humans. You know, you have a human yeah. defense attorney, yeah. you have a human prosecutor, <laughs> you have a human judge, and you have a human jury, and we're not perfect. How many times have we read the story? I just read one recently of a man. I can't remember exactly how long he had been in jail, but he had been jailed for rape. He'd been in jail. It was over 20 years, if I remember correctly. And DNA evidence, DNA evidence, which wasn't available at the time, exonerated him. He's now out of jail. Now, this is a two-way street, and we certainly want to take care of anybody that's perpetrated sexual abuse. I want them to take the, the full uh, consequences of the law uh, should be on them, mm -hmm. but it's got to be right, and we cannot uh, allow ourselves to get in a situation where we become the judge and the jury uh, and the executioner as the Southern Baptist Convention. That's not our job. Now, uh, we yeah. have well over 300 pages of reports now. We have, the, of course, we have the guidepost report. We have the, uh, the task forces report and their recommendation to the convention. We've got over 300 pages of information. We have a gentleman who is running for president of our convention, Dr. Tom Askall, who in a one minute and 50 second clip explained the problem and what we need to do about it. And in essence, what, uh, what Brother Tom said was there are some sins that are not crimes. There are some crimes that are not sins. If it, then God has set forth in his word a way to handle both of those things. If it's sin, exactly. the church has church discipline. The church should deal yep. with that. The leadership, the pastors, the elders of a church should handle their own church discipline within their church. Do we fail at that? Often we do. Uh, churches need to do better at church discipline. Uh, and then yes, they the do. Lord has set up the magistrate. And as Tom said, it's either the state authority, the local municipality, whomever, if a crime has been committed or there's suspicion that a crime has been committed, committed, then involve the local authorities. That's really the only job they have from God to do. And so Tom yeah. explained it in a minute and 50 seconds what it's taken the, the, the task force, uh, you know, somewhere around four million dollars and uh, 300 pages to explain. And then they didn't get it right. <coughs> and they want many, many millions more. But uh, hey, it's, uh, uh, Tom, you, you mentioned yeah. uh, uh, innocent till proven guilty. Uh, I remember one of my last faculty meetings I was in that Mueller appointed a woman very high up in the uh, administration. I don't know if she's technically administration, but she's high up at Southern right. Seminary. And she was appointed to be the um, sort of like the advocate for any woman who makes any kind of accusation uh, with anybody at Southern Seminary. Right. Of course, there was nobody put in a position of advocating for the person who was being uh, accused. Right. So Southern Seminary was already putting their thumb on the scales. Mm -hmm. If you are accused of something, you're basically guilty until you prove yourself innocent. Right. She already, ma yeah. uh, the woman already has an advocate. You right. don't have an advocate, you see. And yeah, so and that, this is this is social justice, uh, uh, practically speaking. And so is. Maybe I ought to ask yeah. Al about that next time at your next uh, uh, meeting. Well, and see, I don't have an issue with there being an advocate for victims yes. of abuse. Uh, right. But one, I said victims of abuse, not women, because right, everyone can be a victim of abuse. But paid staff. Uh, that's where you're putting your thumb on the scale. That's where right. you're you're leaning into something that you shouldn't be leaning in. Now, if there's again, if there's a someone who's on staff that's already doing something else that helps with that, that's one thing. If there's somebody that's uh, there on a non-staff basis, that's a different thing. Again, as soon as assuming they're doing it from a biblical standpoint, right? But to have a someone in the administration specifically only for the woman. Correct. Which, I, I, we're not going to pick apart all the errors there, but uh, Tom, yeah. you said a lot of good things there about the, uh, uh, the sexual abuse uh, task force, about the report, everything. What has Moeller, you know, you mentioned Tom, Tom Askell, what you said, a minute and 30 yeah, to handle it. Uh, how, yeah. Minute and 50. Okay. How has Moeller, handled this 
Well, I mean, his initial uh, response uh, back in May when the Guidepost Solutions came out was uh, uh, very affirming uh, of it. And, and it, you know, he expressed it from the standpoint of being heartbroken about all the people that were uh, that have been abused and misused. And certainly we would be. I mean, that that would be true. Um, I, I can't tell you uh, in any absolute way, but I, I do know that. Uh, the task force had an initial set of recommendations that they have toned down. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so, uh, and, and the, I think the entity heads yeah. would take credit and perhaps they are due credit uh, for uh, communicating with the task force and saying, you need to back off on this a little bit. Uh, so I would, I would suggest that when we get to Anaheim, the entity heads are going to be in favor of the, uh, recommendations that came out on Wednesday uh, from the task force. Um, and, uh, and they are better than the original ones. I, I agree. Uh, but they are not biblical. They are not pragmatic. They are not appropriate for the Southern Baptist convention. We need more time to look at this. Some of the things they've said are, are, are accurate. And some of the things that they have said, uh, we do need to look into. We, we, we do need to take this seriously. Uh, but uh, we need our new president to appoint a new task force to reconsider all this and to take our time with this. Uh, the idea that one of the recommendations, Kyle, is to create a ministry check website. And I just want to say, wow, that's that's kind of sounds like Big Brother to me. That is the last yeah. thing the Southern Baptist Convention needs. And then, of course, the, the terminology that they use is credibly accused. Well, we already know <laughs> that uh, the task force and guidepost solutions can't credibly accuse people because they have wrongly accused people already. We can't afford to mm -hmm. have that have that happen. Um, and I, now I think there's some on the other side that would say, well, you know, if it stops uh, one abuser from abusing one person, uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many people get falsely accused. Well, yes, it does. Uh, we need to work yeah, on, on both sides of this thing. And so uh, I, I will be opposed to the task force recommendations. I am not opposed to our convention doing whatever it can uh, in, in, in a biblical sense to try to help churches along this line, but I'm not for uh, producing any uh, sort of oversight uh, from the executive committee or some new uh, organization or entity that they're talking about creating. That is totally unnecessary. Yeah. And I fear that if these recommendations go through, we are gonna see a mass exodus, if not from the convention, from cooperative program giving, because uh, oh, yeah. one, one report says that uh, the total cost of this is gonna be about 9.5 million a year and that it would cost the International Mission Board something in the neighborhood of four million, which equates to about 75 missionaries. Uh, this is well, something that needs to be Did you see they already away. bypassed that if you didn't see? Yeah. Uh, if you didn't see that Kevin Azell uh, volunteered the money from Send Relief. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Which we're not even going to get into that because that... Yeah, that's a whole other... That's a whole other... Yeah. yeah worms, but it? one thing one thing I want to bring up is, you know, you mentioned the term credibly accused. And I want to clarify for people listening that may not know. Credibly accused is not the same as uh, credible guilt. Right. Credibly right. accused means that the accusation is credible, not necessarily true. It's not assessing the truth of the accusations, it's just assessing whether the accusation itself is just Right. It, essentially, it's is it a logically consistent? Does it does it have the potential of being valid? Not is the person potential is the person guilty, credibly guilty? Those are different things. That is a very low standard. It but, is extremely low. Uh, we've been going for quite a long time. So, uh, quickly from both of you, thirty seconds, uh, just because we, we've gone a long time now. Thirty seconds. Why does any of this matter, any of what we're talking about matter for someone who's listening who is not Southern Baptist? Well, the Southern Baptist Convention well, has, a, has a tremendous impact uh, with its size and its missionary force throughout Christendom. 
And uh, I mean, mm-hmm. and we, we need to partner with our brothers and sisters in Christ and other denominational groups that believe in the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. And uh, if, the, if the Southern Baptist Convention goes down, uh, that's going to have a negative impact on evangelical Christianity as a whole. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tom, Tom is completely correct on that. And even when a smaller denomination like the Presbyterian Church in America, we're seeing them also go down the tubes right now. Even a small one like that has a very negative influence right. upon evangelicalism as a whole. Yeah. And with the Southern Baptist Convention on a much higher level, no question. Oh, yeah. And, you know, personally, I'll bring up because uh, I, I was raised in Baptist churches all my life, but not Southern Baptist. Uh mainly because I'm from the, I'm originally from Western Washington and there weren't many Southern Baptist churches where I was. <laughs> I think the nearest one was over a half hour away. Uh, but the nomination I mainly grew up in was the Baptist General Conference, now oh, yeah. uh, Converge, terrible name. Uh, but they're, they're going uh, the same direction as the SBC. Right. And mm-hmm. from what I've seen, they're kind of following the coattails of the SBC. So the direction that you take one has an influence on others. And I know specifically, uh, Baptist pastors, I'm just saying Baptist, not Southern Baptist, Baptist in general, the vast majority are trained where? Right. The Southern Baptist seminaries, Uh, especially among the smaller Baptist denominations that can't have their own seminary. Uh, it's a huge impact. So I want to thank you two both so much for being here. This has been a wonderful conversation, but uh, I wanted to give you two both a chance to just, you know, are there any final thoughts you have? And I'll, I'll kick it to you, Dr. Rush, first. Are there any final thoughts you have? Uh, is there any way we can pray for you, support you in things? Uh, is there any ministries that you're involved with that you would like to highlight? Well, thank you, Cal, for that opportunity. Uh, Yeah, certainly uh, pray for all of the messengers that are going out to Anaheim. That's an immediate prayer Mm -hmm. request. But, you know, ongoing, God uh, has uh, called me into a ministry of evangelism. And uh, just pray for the Lord's uh, opportunities in my life. I'm available to come and and speak to churches to talk about the very issues to their congregations that we have been discussing on this podcast. Uh, If people want to uh, know about my ministry, I have a website. It's TREAD, T-R-E-A-D, TREADMinistries.org. And they can go to TREADMinistries.org, and all my contact information is there, and uh, my blog post and so forth are there. So, uh, And some uh, sermon information, links to my YouTube channel, that sort of thing. And uh, be uh, be glad to to have folks on board. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm doing that I'm great – feel like it's a great privilege in my life is that uh, Dr. Fuller's asked me to join the faculty of theology classroom. And so I, I, I'll be teaching a course on evangelism this fall. So I'd love to have uh, anybody that wants to know about evangelism and how it's done in the local church to, uh, to join us for that. Yeah. <laughs> I actually uh, had a young man, a disciple. Uh, I sent him through, uh, Dr. Rush did a course on pastoral ministry, right. and I made sure to send him to that, uh, and it really it really helped him uh, get his head around his journey into pastoral ministry oh, as he's going on. That's fantastic. Uh, Dr. Fuller, uh, you know, same question to you. Any final thoughts? Uh, how can we pray for you? Uh, I know you've been through a, a lot of rough times since leaving, but you've also been through a lot of good things, and one of those... Uh, Dr. Rush already mentioned it, is your theology classroom. So please plug that. Okay. Uh, Yes, once I left Southern, I didn't know what I was going to do. But uh, uh, someone mentioned to me, hey, why don't you go online and start teaching? And and when I first heard it, I thought that's, you know, I'm 60 years old. I can't do that. (laughs) By the time I drove home uh, four miles later, I'm like, why not? I've never done something (laughs) like this. Well, I give it a shot. And the Lord has really helped us and blessed us. And uh, so if you'll pray that uh, the Lord will be honored in, in a theology classroom. If you're interested, go to RussellTFuller.com and you can get more information uh, about my uh, classes. Or you can 
you, you can contact me again. There's a if you, if you go on my website, it's got where you can contact me as an email. You can come to my Facebook page or, or whatever and try to you know contact me through there as well. But uh, the Lord has been very good to us. And again, I've got a very good ministry man, a guy who's done everything in ministry, whether it's being a chaplain, whether it's being a, a, a pastor in a local church, interim, you name it. Tom Rush has done it. And so I'm so proud to have him as part of Theology Classroom. We really emphasize the core of the theological curriculum. So we do a lot of Greek and Hebrew. But if you don't, if Greek and Hebrew is not your thing, we like I'm, we're going to be offering Old Testament theology, the Pentateuch, the books of Peter in this coming semester. And there's other offerings as well. So we would love to have you come. And again, we try to be um, affordable. We're, we're not expensive. We're, we're, uh, and again, we're hoping down the road to uh, continue to uh, uh, maybe even expand some of our course offerings and different things. But we're really excited what the Lord's doing right now. And so, again, if you could just pray for me on that, I, I would be uh, greatly appreciative. Yeah, and I'll make sure to provide links uh, for both Good. your theology classroom and also for uh, Tread Ministries. Right, thank uh, you. So people can, you know, if you look in the description of the video or if you're listening on audio, uh, there should be a description there as well, depending on the platform you're on. And you can just go straight there. Right. Uh, as well as, obviously, links to enemies within the church. But I want to thank both of you so much for being here. This has been wonderful. I'm glad that God has been so good and blessed you both uh, in this journey, because I know the, the journey of blowing the whistle is not an easy one. It's a rocky road, and it seems mm -hmm. to be all twisted and tangled, uh, but it's so good when you stop and turn back and realize that what you thought was a rocky, twisted, nasty road is perfectly straight and god had it just <laughs> yep amen a smooth perfect road the entire time yeah. it just seemed awful from our perspective at the time uh <laughs> god is good that's an encouragement to everyone if amen. you're in a position where you see something that is going wrong do your research on it first exactly but call it out call it out uh but thank you uh dr rush thank you dr fuller uh thank this you. has been a yeah. blessing to me this has been a pleasure and uh thank you all for listening for watching this if you have any suggestions on people we should interview or topics we should cover especially after listening to some of the things i mean i know listening to the two of you i got many ideas of things that we need to highlight <laughs> uh but contact us uh you can leave comments on uh wherever you're listening to this podcast or you can contact us at contactwokipedia at gmail.com and give us some feedback on what you've heard. Uh, God bless you and lean on him. He's good. He's good even when times are rough. He's good even when the woke are attacking the church. Uh, he will not be defeated. It doesn't matter who's coming against you when God's on your side. You're, on, you're in the majority That's when you're right. on God's side. Uh, so God bless you all. And remember, don't go woke. <laughs>